So our first speaker is Nimri uh, Samano. Uh, Nimri, you are here. Thank you very much for turning up. And he's going to talk to us about the first part, which is where it all starts uh, at the airfoil of the turbine. Thank you. My supervisor is Wei Hu, also from University of South Africa. And my other supervisor is Ahmed Elbaz from the British University. Um, given this opportunity today, I'm going to discuss um, about optimization of bio-inspired corrugated airfoil. It is well known that um, small-scale wind turbine were not seriously considered in the past few decades. Um, this is due to their poor efficiency that is associated with um, conventional airfoil. Um, figure one on the side is trying to show um, a typically conventional um, airfoil wheel. Um, on the other hand, uh, corrugated airfoil based on dragon winds have been reported to perform very well at a low Reynolds number with their advantages of delaying stall and also their structural stiffness. Optimization, uh, sorry, aerodynamics performance of um, corrugated airfoil wheel has been conducted in the previous studies but um, no optimization for the shape uh, has been done to date. Sorry. Um, here on the next slide, I was trying to show um, previous research on the similar study for corrugated airfoil wing. Um, this experimental was conducted by Hu and Tamai to compare three types of um, wind blades, which is flat blade, um, streamlined airfoil, and um, corrugated one. Um, we can see there's a legend on the table here to show that uh, which one is flat plate and which one is um, streamlined and corrugated. Um, the experimental was conducted at a Reynold number of 34,000, um, the wind tunnel. Um, we can see from the graph the results obtained by Hu and Tamai. From angle of attack of zero up to eight, the lift coefficient was comparable um, as the angle of attack increases, um, also the wind, the, the lift coefficient increases. However, at angle of attack of eight, that's where we see the differences of performance of these three, three, three types of turbines. Um, the streamlined airfoil lift coefficient drops off significantly, as shown on the curve, while the flat plate remain constant and uh, the corrugated airfoil delays stall up to 12 degrees. Um, from the graph, it can also be concluded that to optimize the shape of um, the corrugated airfoil wheel, one has to focus on angle of attack above 12 degrees, uh, between 12 degrees and 18 degrees of angle of attack. Here is another research done by Hu and Yum. Um, this was to compare two types of corrugated airfoil. Um, they've used NACA 0010 as the baseline to compare the performances. Um, the red node number for this was 10,000. Um, as we can see from the figure three, at angle of attack of zero, uh, the performance for both corrugated and also for the streamline were comparable. Um, the reason being is that at the corrugated at low speed, uh, the peaks, the, cor the vertices, they remain stagnant or move slowly and create a boundary so that it behaves same as the, um, the conventional one. But as angle of attack increases, that's where we spot the difference. Uh, for example, at angle of attack of, um, of 20, we can see um, the conventional airfoil has a, a big, large um, flow separation bubble at um, the upper surface, while um, the corrugated ones, they are at um, the mid span, it's two of them. And then um, the difference between corrugate A and B is that um, corrugate A has a heap 
that um, causes the pressure, the pressure to, to reduce compared to corrugated A. Okay, uh, the figure shown here is a typical um, dragonfly wing um, in sections. As we can see, these are the sections showing relatively to its section. These sections, they're actually grouped into two groups, which is corrugated A and corrugated B. Um, as we can see from the tip, from, from the root of, 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 the, of the span, up to 0 0.7 relative length, um, these sections are more uh, grouped to be corrugated B, while else the remaining one from 0 0.7 relative length to the tip are uh, more into corrugated A. This is just an overview of that. Um, well, um, the purpose of this research was to optimize a corrugated airfoil wing at um, different types of angle of attack, which were 5, 10, 15, and 20 degrees. This was done to enhance the performance of um, small-scale wind turbine, and um, the corrugated coordinates were taken from previous research. Um, the study was conducted using CFD model. We use um, ANSYS Workbench Design Explorer, uh, two-dimensional. Um, it was pressure-based solver at a steady state because this is um, incompressible. And to deal with flow separation, we use shear stress transport K omega. Although it is a steady state, um, unsteady term was introduced uh, in the solution term to accurately um, deal with the behavior of convergency. And um, that is pseudo transient at 0 0.01 sec and convergency monitors were set to 0 0.001. Yeah. Um, boundary conditions were set for this model with an inlet velocity of 2.799 meters per second at a standard air density of 1.225 kg per cubic meter. Um, symmetry walls at the top and bottom uh, the fluid domain of this was 10 times cut of um, airfoil, a corrugated airfoil, which was 50.25 millimeter. Um, the fluid domain was, oops, sorry. The fluid domain was separated from, um, from the corrugated using boiling operations. Okay. Here we can see the machines that was performed for this type of airfoil. It was quadrilateral, uh, unstructured, with the first um, inflation layer height of 0 0.06 uh, millimeter and um, at a growth rate of 1.2. Okay. Um, finer mesh was required at the trailing, at the trailing of. Um, of the corrugated airfoil. This was done also to accurately capture the vortices of, um, of the corrugated. Mesh independency was also conducted with an aspect ratio of 6.21. Um, and the total mesh element was 19. Um, why is it not coming? Uh, the total mesh element was 19153, and um, the mesh quality was acceptable at 0 0.52 using orthogonal quality. Okay, here we move to the design constraints that we use for our modeling. In actual fact, we had um, 20 input parameters. We had um, 10 of them in horizontal and 10 of them in, um, in vertical. Um, parametric expression were also used in this experiment to link um, the, upper, the upper points uh, with the lower points. 
um, and also it was used to restrain a, a node not to move by 30% to its adjacent uh, node. Those were the design um, constraint taken for this um, modeling. Here are the results shown in, um, in the profile. Um, there was a significant effect in optimizing this um, corrugated airfoil, um, as it could be seen for lower angle of attack, for example, five degree, in order to, 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 to minimize the drug, which is this one, um, it, it could be seen that um, the corrugated uh, seek to flatten out and also wanted to behave as um, some experimental conducted by whom? In Tamai. And also, oh shoot, sorry. And also, to, 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 for, for maximum coefficient of lift, it could be seen that the second peak, which is that uh, for corrugated ones, they're, al they're always at the highest and the same graph for, for maximum at, for maximum lift at, um, at the trailing edge, it's always the lowest. These results were also done using a pressure plot um, with respect to length of a cord. Um, in actual fact, one could see that um, the graphs here for y-axis, they are reversed. Um, this was done for simplicity um, because um, at the upper, the upper, the upper unit of um, of the corrugated, it's it's negative, which shows low pressure region, and at the lower surface, it's positive, which shows um, high pressure region. For angle of attack of five and ten, it could be seen that um, the low pressure region of the optimized shape has extended to the second peak of the corrugated, while else the baseline, which is the blue one, drops after um, the first peak. And also, for angle of attack of 15 and 20, it could also seem that um, the coefficient of pressure was extended a bit higher compared to the baseline, but they <coughs> both of them, they dropped at the same first peak. It was also observed that for lower surfaces, the pressure distributions were more or less similar, and with this, we can say they do not have much um, effect on optimization. Okay, um, in conclusion, um, in conclusion, um, each optimized node did not shift more than 30%. Um, in actual fact, they shift, um, the highest point that shifted was 22.6%. So if we have to rerun the experiment, and then we'll, we'll have um, more time compared to what we used to run because it ran for three weeks. Um, the largest increase in um, CL was 20% at angle of attack of five. Um, as shown here on the graph. Oh, sorry. Um, there's there's um, the largest one that has increased. So we can see at 10, there was no major um, change or difference of which maybe um, the baseline that we took is more or less suitable for this angle. Um, okay, and then um, the largest decrease was found at angle of attack at 20. So it means there was a significant um, need for to optimize at angle of attack at 20. And then um, the lift over drug was 52.42% at also at 20. Okay. <coughs> Okay, um, these are some of the references that we've used, um, but um, they're not all here. 
if you're interested, you can find it on the paper that is published for this topic. Um, at the moment, we are still busy with creating a 3D, blending um, all the optimized shape into an existing wind turbine. Um, the aim is to run a fluid structure interface and compare the result of um, the optimized one and, um, and um, the one that is bought from the manufacturer. Um, I can say the model has been bought by the university and it's on site um, and they're gonna install it, but as soon as the simulation is finished and manufacturing um, the optimized shape, we're gonna replace it and, um, and compare. Thank you. Thank you, Nimirini. So do we have any questions about this interesting approach to wind turbines? We have a question over there. Hello, I would like to ask a question uh, which modeling strategy do you use for your aerodynamic uh, simulation and also which software did you pick up to simulate each kind of uh, degree or each kind of angle of attack that you, you show us in your model? Um. Uh, for, for the modeling strategy, I, 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 I'm a pick up uh, mostly for mathematic model. Did you uh, make some mathematic model, or maybe it was just uh, you, you have your stuff, you put it on software, you know, like some mechanical software, you have just your, uh, your blood, you can put it there, and uh, you, don't have, you, don't, you don't need some time having a mathematic model, you can make your simulation and you have a result. Okay, um, the CFD method, or the software that we used, it's, um, it's ANSYS. It's been validated um, that it can work for low Reynolds number. There's been some background research done from maybe from other previous papers. Um, which, yes. which kind of mathematical model did you pick it up to design your, your model? Um, to optimize your system, I mean. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding your question. I, I say, I say which did you make some mathematic modeling for to, to, to optimize your system? Um, <coughs> can I pass it to you? I think we could, could we move on to the next question? Uh, and you can ask him again later. I think what he's saying is you comp use computational fluid dynamics and that typically runs a Novia Stokes equation. So, so this is yes, pretty it's standard, standard, uh, standard mathematical modeling. Uh, any more questions? We have a question right at the back there. Hi, thank you, sir. Thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. Just two questions, okay? Noise production and flutter on the blade. Uh, will you include it later, perhaps, in, uh, as perhaps uh, constraints in your optimization, or? The acoustics, right? Acoustics and flutter, yes. Um, Thank you. Yes, um, the acoustics, um, we're still dealing with that because this is um, a residential um, wind turbine of, um, I think it's for domestic usage, of which maybe the power output may be one kilowatt. So, but we're still dealing with the acoustics of that. It's considered. Thank you. Another question on that side? Right there. So, um, I'm not familiar with CFD, but I think I'm familiar with uh, uh, ANSYS Mechanical. ANSYS Mechanical. And Workbench. Uh, okay. I'm interested in knowing how you did the optimization. Um, because I know you should use design of experiments. Yes. But I... I yes. Um, in ANSYS Workbench, there is um, a designer explorer of which way you have to parameterize your inputs. Hence I said like um, 
there were in actual fact that corrugated has 28 points, but we we had to take 20 of them due to the constraints of ANSYS workbench. Um, so you have to para uh, you have to use. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Design Explorer first. Yes, what what we did it's um, we we had expressions that we wanted um, then each node not to change maybe more than 80% because um, the problems that we were having was that if we just optimize it, um, some of the nodes were um, overlapping and um, it was becoming a funny shape. That is why we came across and say, okay, we're gonna constrain it to 13. But um, it appears that the maximized one uh, did not necessarily have to be 30% change of notes, of which it was 22.6%. Yes, and then from there I used um, Fluent um, to run the simulation. Um, what, what I did, it's, um, I did not change the angle of attack. Um, I was avoiding to do remeshing. And in actual fact, I had to change the flow direction. We have time for one more question. No questions? What about the shape of this turbine when it gets built one day? It's going to be very <laughs> interesting. Thank you very much, Nebrini. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Johan, for the kind introduction. Welcome, everybody. Um, we have a rather complex topic ahead, and uh, I hope I managed to walk you through it. It might be a little bit hard to digest, but um, I do my best, I promise. Um, so, what do we do? Um, basically, our institute. Okay, where's the next slide? Okay, this one's forward. That's forward. All right, yeah, and no, it's okay. It's okay. We can leave it. All right. <laughs> okay, nice. Um, thank you very much. Um, so, where was I? Oh, yeah. Um, what do we do at the Institute? Basically, um, what we mainly deal with is not measurements. That's just um, a tool for us. And what we try to do is to work on the grid integration of wind turbines. So how can we uh, make sure that the turbine actually does what the grid needs and instead of just producing power? And um, that's quite a, quite a topic in, in um, grids with... Um, with a uh, higher penetration of wind turbines like uh, Quebec or Ireland or even uh, Germany. And um, <clears throat> in order to do that, we need a kind of good simulation models and therefore we use the measurements to, to kind of set up uh, or find the parameters for our model. So this is a little bit background. And um, so what we're gonna see is, or what, what we've always seen in the past is that our turbines um, are excited by a turbulent wind wind speed, so meaning that um, uh, in three dimensions, which is the height, um, like side to side, and um, also time, um, the wind, change, uh, wind speed changes. And um, our turbine, depending on where the rotors are positioned, um, kind of sees a lot of different wind speeds during one rotation, it's called rotational sampling. And an additional effect that we get now is um, that we might have excitations which come from the grid. So um, by controlling our turbine to the needs of the grid, we might actually cause um, harmful vibrations in the turbine. And um, so today I'm gonna talk about two questions. Um, if we already have vibrations in the turbine at uh, certain operating points without changing the controller, um, we might actually be very vulnerable during that state. And so we try to find out what are the vulnerable operating points of the turbine and where do these vibrations come from. And um, the second as important um, question is, if we see mechanical vibrations, do they also show in the, in the power production for the grid? Because um, that might mess with our grid compliance, meaning that our grid operator is not gonna be happy about what our turbine is doing. Um, so, basically, what we have here on campus um, is quite a, quite a good situation. We have a medium-sized wind turbine, an old Anacon, um, but that still 
in, in terms of the vibrational behavior very much comparable to today's wind turbines. And furthermore, we have a meteorological mask, um, which is in the southwesterly direction, like 100 meters in front of the turbine. Um, so in a lot of situations, we get an idea of what the inflow is doing to the turbine. And um, now what we did in a, in a previous project, equip this um, MET mast and the turbine with new sensors. And I'm gonna br very briefly walk you through the measurement system. If you're interested in that, there's a lot more on our homepage. Um, we have a, quite an extensive report on the system and what we've done with it. So um, to start with the MET mast, um, we put in place what the, it's called ultrasonic anemeters. And these are capable of measuring the wind speed and also the wind direction with a very high timely resolution. So if you're using a cup anemometer, you always is restricted by the inertia of the, of the anemometer um, to about one hertz measurement. And um, with this ultrasonics um, we and our existing data logger, we can get up to 10 hertz. Um, second thing is that's very important is the pitch angle. Um, the problem here was that Anacon didn't want to give us the pitch angle from the scatter system, so we had to come up with a measurement system on our own. And as it being a retrofit, um, we designed, or a colleague of mine designed um, a contactless um, pitch sensor, um, which you all, I think you can also find publications of wind energy on that. And um, the next thing was, um, like, we have a lot of vibrations in the tower. So in, in, in some situations, we see that the, the turbine actually shuts down because the tower had moves too much. And um, in order to, that, to measure that situation, um, we have like an um, acceleration sensor put in place up there as well. And um, then also, a very important quantity when talking about um, um, reliable speed wind turbines is of course the rotor speed. So in our situation, we have a, a gearless wind turbine. Um, therefore, it's sufficient to measure the rotor speed at one position. So we're here at the back of the generator and um, we designed a, a measurement system with um, a, what's called a contrast sensor and this gives us um, um, like a contactless um, rotation speed measurement with I think 360 pulses per revolution. So very high resolution. And um, last but not least, of course, we want to measure the power because this is what it's all about. And um, I gave you two examples there. One is the DC link, um, DC link voltage measurement on top, uh, which was quite straightforward. And then for um, an the AC grid side, we use what's called Rogowski coils, so standard measurement equipment. Um, so it's important to understand that we have a gearless wind turbine and we have a generator with a full converter behind it. So we have an AC generator circuit with a reliable frequency, then we have the DC link and um, the grid side, which is obviously also AC with a fixed frequency. Um, because I'm going to talk about power measurements on the DC link as well as on the grid side. Um, so this is all about the dynamic behavior of the wind turbine. And um, when you want to talk about dynamic behavior, you can't avoid the Campbell diagram, I'm afraid. Um, what we see here is basically on the y-axis, you see frequencies. So these are these horizontal lines. And that's what they call the eigenfrequencies. You can say, okay, if I, um, if I just leave the system as it is, or give it a push and then leave it uh, on its own, it will vibrate with that frequency. And um, as we have a lot of components, we have um, a lot of eigenfrequencies. Um, I show here five frequencies. So the most important ones are the, the lower two, which is the lowest one is the power eigenfrequency. And the second one is, um, second horizontal line from the bottom, is the first flapwise eigenfrequency of the blades. So usually when we're in part load operation, turbine is not pitched, that's our wind direction. 
And um, the second thing here, on the x-axis you see the rotor speed in RPM. So basically what you often have, um, or what, what you usually put in there is the, what is called the 1p and the 3p excitation. So as I said, we see excitations from a wind, and luckily these are in a quite wide frequency range and changing all the time. So um, the turbine would not excite to vibrations just from that. Well, it's very un unlikely to do that. But what we see, having three blades and being a rotational machine, we see quite a lot of periodic forces caused by that. And that is, um, that's what you depict by the red line here. Um, this, uh, yeah, this line. And then also, what you might have is mass imbalances. So one blade might be heavier than the other ones. And that would give you the 1p excitations, which is down here. And 1p meaning one time per revolution, you're going to get an excitation. OK? Um, we could put up many more lines there. But these are the two most important ones for the wind turbines. And um, what you now want to avoid during the design is intersections between these lines during your operating range. Um, the operating range is depicted as vertical dashed lines here. So we actually see that we have some intersections here, especially in this part, which might be problematic. Let's zoom in a little bit to this region. So you see the same thing again. And um, you see that the first flapwise eigenfrequency of the blades, meaning being in wind direction in this moment, um, intersects with the 3P excitation. And that's um, not as problematic because, you get a l because the wind changes so much. So you get a lot of dampening on that. Um, but what is very pro problematic is the lower one here. And so basically the next slides where I show measurements is about investigating that operating point. Do we actually see vibrations of the tower caused by the rotor speed, or do we not? Hmm? I think it's kind of stuck here. Um, down there now? Okay. Seems like your computer doesn't like my presentation. <laughs> um, okay, what, what you would usually do, or what we would expect um, the turbine manufacturer to do, um, these situations are not easy to avoid. So you can shift this eigenfrequency by the design but that usually means you have to put in more material. So it's a, it's a matter of cost. Making your, making your tower heavier, putting more steel in, that's um, something you want to avoid. Um, so what, I, what we expected at first when we saw the Campbell diagram, um, that Anacron actually put um, measures in the control system in place to avoid the, or to, to, to minimize what is called the dwell time in these situations. So um, if, I, if I get in a resonance situation, that is actually not a problem. It's only a problem if I stay there for a longer time, so a couple of seconds or even longer. And um, is the five minutes? <laughs> um, so what I'm going to show you, show you just now is how the rotational speed um, is related to the acceleration of the tower. And I give you two examples where we, we can actually see um, that these situations are not avoided. Uh, shame, man. OK, can you, can you start from the next slide? OK, OK. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> Tough to describe it without the words, <laughs> uh, without the pictures. Um, so basically, what we see is whenever we approach the critical speed, the resonance speed, our um, tower starts to vibrate. So it starts to move more, lo and more and more and more. And um, that's um, certainly something you, avoid, you, want to, you want to avoid. So basically, what we found during the research is that um, this turbine seems not to avoid this one piece situations or the, this resonance um, situation. And um, that, m that might be very problematic if we want to control the turbine towards the need of the grid in this situation. So if I do something, you know, a typical thing you would do to support the grid is change the power set point of the turbine. If I change it with the same frequency um, as, as um, the tower, then I certainly get an, an additional excitation. Okay, um, can you then skip the next slide and start the presentation from the, um, the next one? <laughs> so two, two slides from one. Um, okay, um, yeah, we, we basically have all of these graphs in, in our paper, so you are very happy to ask me questions about it and um, get in touch with me via email or so if you, if you have to look into it later. Um, so, so basically, we found that uh, at this operating point, we might get into trouble when trying to control the wind turbine. So that's to the first research question I put up earlier. The second one is, um, how does how does these me mechanical vibrations affect our power productions? And um, for that, we did what is called an analysis of frequency spectra. So we basically compared the frequency spectra of the rotor speed with the one from the DC link and the one from the grid power and looked whether the, the peaks in the spectra are at the same frequency. So um, as I said before, um, oh, we, we analyzed basically two situations. One was where we are in resonance, so that the ro rotational speed is at the eigenfrequency of the tower and we see a strong vibration in the rotational speed and also in the DC link power. But what we found then, because all the power has to travel through the DC link to get into the grid, that actually the capacitor in the DC link helps to dampen these oscillations. And so this is actually very good news because um, if it wouldn't do that, our grid power would fluctuate with 0.5 hertz here, and that might be a big issue for the grid operator, because that's what um, it's the frequency of range, what we call flicker. So you might know, know that from, from lightning bulbs, that they um, change the brightness a little bit. And that's, that's what's caused by, by voltage changes, is, and such a thing could be um, excited by, by such an effect. Oh, here we go. Um, so Basically, let me check, lower part load, okay. So basically what I talked about just now is the peak here, the yellow peak, and this is much higher than the, the um, grid power peak. And um, second situation, so I want to briefly show you. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, what happens here? Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> A lot of back and forward. Um, so second situations, what happened? Um, we, had a, we had a really strong gust. So um, coming up from, say, 6 meters per second to 12 meters per second wind. And um, so we got into a, a situation where we are above rated, rated um, rotor speed, and our pitch angle starts to increase uh, and tries to, to, to um, keep it a constant at 50 RPM here. But what we actually see is that the pitch angle is reacting too slowly um, to, to get in control, and that we actually have here vibrations of the rotational speed. Um, and if we look at that in the frequency spectra, 
we basically see that these effects are hardly dampened. So if we're here at, at um, full load, uh, or close to full load operation, um, there's less, less space for dampening here for us. And we see that the peaks here, so the pitch angle, um, tries to kind of um, catch the rotational speed, um, make it stick to 50 RPM, but it doesn't manage to do that. And that's why these peaks are matching these peaks here. Um, yeah, so I think I have one minute left. Um, quick conclusion, uh, we've seen that the data actually um, supports the, the, the assumption that the 1P effect has a strong in, um, effect on our vibrational behavior and that we might get into trouble there um, when we want to support the grid. And um, the second thing with, that we've seen is that the DC link helps to, to dampen grid power oscillations which come from the turbine. And if we look in the other direction, we also see that um, if our grid power oscillates, it does not go back into the rotational speed, which is quite important because if, um, that, if, if such a thing would happen, then um, we can get really into trouble with our mechanical design of the drivetrain or the blades, et cetera. <coughs> so um, sorry about the confusion, and um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ani. Technology has not been kind to you there. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to give you time for two questions, two short questions, please. Thank you. We have a question over here. Hi. Um, so your work is uh, very interesting to me because we are actually doing something very similar, but uh, from computational point of view. Mm. So I just have two questions. So for you, you, you um, moved on to tower vibration because you thought that was the important one. Mm -hmm. Will you continue to do the blade clustering, the blade vibration, and, um, and do the same study again? Yeah, um, actually, to set up a measurement system which, which actually measures the blade, the blade vibration, it's much more complicated because then you're in the rotating part of the turbine and you might have noticed that we've done or tried to do all the, the measurements stationary from the nacelle. Yeah. So um, we couldn't um, really figure out how to, like there would have been ways, but it would have been really complicated to, to install acceleration sensors in the blade. Um, so unfortunately, we can't do this on this turbine. Um, we have a second research wind turbine where we might have acceleration sensors. I'm not sure, but I could find out for you if you give me your details. But, but do you think the blade vibrations will have some effects on the power generation? Um, I would guess so, yes. Um, certainly in edgewise direction, or like say in in-plane direction, which is for zero degree pitch angle edgewise. Um, so, because that basically directly goes into your rotational speed. Okay. And um, we've seen, um, depending on the operating point, we've seen some of the eigenfrequency of the blades in the rotational speed. So we were lucky to, to know the eigenfrequency from a previous project. Um, so we could look for them in the frequency spectra of the rotational speed. Okay, and then the, the last one is uh, just a short one. Okay. You have the wind, the temporary wind measurements uh, mm -hmm. data, right? I mean, you didn't show it here, but I presume you have it somewhere. Yeah. Like how do. the wind changes. Eh? Yeah. Okay. So I think I'll, I'll talk to you more because, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, one more quick one. <laughs> quick. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's one over there, please. Hi, I'm Johan. Uh, thanks for the very interesting uh, presentation. Um, so what you basically show is typical problem with data drive turbines. Okay, D You want to minimize the variation in the air gap, basically. That's it. But how do you account for residual uh, vibrations, not dampen out uh, is it super, those superimposed vibrations that's still lingering while new vibrations or new excitation is coming in? Um, what, in what, what component do you mean? If you have uh, the vibration excited by the rotor, yeah. uh, and that, that vibration of a specific, at a specific wind speed is not dampened out by the system, it's still progressing. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you have a spike in wind and you have a new excitation, so you have superimposed vibrations. Yeah, um, actually, I would have loved to show you that situation, but that was the slide that didn't work. Um, how do we deal with it? Thank you. We, we can't um, alternate the, the control systems of the, our existing wind turbines, so we have to take the, the power production as is. Um, to be honest, we haven't looked into um, superimposing frequencies when we were doing our, um, our, our studies on the controls. Um, because our blade model was probably not accurate enough for that yet. So we, we um, uh, in the future, we plan to go to a full, um, what is called, aeroelastic model um, and implement that in our simulation model and then we might be able to see, see effects there, I would expect. All right, thank you. Thank you, Arnie. Thank you very much. <laughs> My name is Akiola Ajayobi, and I'm from um, University of Cape Town. I'm a doctoral student, and my supervisor is uh, Prof. Azim Khan. Um, today, my presentation is going to be on um, comparative evaluation of transformerless configurations for wind energy conversion systems. And when I say wind energy conversion systems, I'm saying the same thing as just wind turbines. Okay, so through the course of my Okay, okay. Through the course of my presentation, I'll take us through a quick um, overview of why we are interested so much in the wind turbine transformers. Give us a quick rundown of the classification of the ver various types of wind turbine transformers existing, and also introduce the concept of transformerless um, configurations. Look at the existing um, configurations and at the comparative evaluation and discussion stage, we'll be estimating the conduction losses and switching losses of the grid side of the converter topologies in each of those um, configurations. So let's just get on with it. Um, for those very familiar with um, wind turbine research, this is actually one of the most famous um, figures in wind turbine um, research. It basically just shows us um, the evolution that has taken place in terms of the power ratings of um, wind turbines in the last um, 37 years, from 1980 till date, and also going towards next year. Now we can see the exponential increase in the size and as well as the power rating. And it's also projected to increase up to, oh, okay. It's projected to increase. It's projected to increase to about 10 megawatts to 20 megawatts by 2018, and currently we have most of our installations being at 1.5 megawatts and 3.6 megawatts. And um, the good thing about it is we can extract more power from a single turbine, but on the downside, most of our wind generators and conversion systems are still um, rated at about 690 volts, which implies that we have more current flowing through the system and more losses in our connecting cables. Now, going forward, if we are progressing towards 10 megawatts and 20 megawatts, we need to build systems whereby we're operating at a much higher voltage level so as to drop our current level simultaneously. Now, one of the questions that has been asked and also been answered is the fact that um, how reliable are high power wind turbines that is rated above one megawatts. And in um, 2007, a research was carried out when they looked at the survey of failures in wind power systems, focusing on the um, wind power plants installed in Sweden. And about 625 installed wind turbines were surveyed. And one of the results they obtained was the fact that um, high-powered um, wind turbines had more higher 
failure rates. And as expected, because you have more components in this system, and at this time, you're still operating at a very low voltage level. Now, and the, the research was carried out between 1997 and 2004. Another, another um, result they obtained was the fact that the number of failure per component before this research was actually perceived to be the gearbox. But after the research, the research was actually coordinated based on field reports they've obtained over the course of seven years. They, they, they got the um, derivation that the electrical system recorded about 23% of the failure rate. And that the gearbox recorded about 4%, but when it comes to the downtime, that is the amount of time required to rectify the faults associated to each component, the gearbox was top with 19.4%, um, and followed by the control systems. And then the third was the electrical system. But in this um, study, what they've done was to lump up the electrical system, including also the converter. So they didn't actually differentiate electrical systems from converters, but other, um, other studies actually did differentiate and they also made the same assumption that the electrical system was indeed responsible for most of the faults then followed by the converter and also the control systems and sensors. Now going forward, another breakdown of the failure distribution in individual components making up the electrical system was put forward and from the from the breakdown, we could see that the power protection unit recorded for most of the failures. Um, the connecting cables, due to, mainly due to the amount of losses, also, also was the second, and then we had the transformer. But why we are interested in the transformer is based on two main reasons. Number one, the downtime required in case the transformer fails is quite high, it's the highest. And apart from that, the transformer itself is the most expensive um, component, most expensive electrical component of the wind turbine. It cost about, estimated about 5% of the total installation cost. It's actually very close to the cost of the converter, which is about 6, 5% as well. Now, why do wind turbines, why do they fail? The first reason is, up until recently, most of the wind turbines were actually just normal, standard power distribution transformers. And the, most, and the reason why developers actually opt for this option is just because of economics. It's cheaper, but the downside is these transformers are designed for steady state operations not taking into consideration the variable nature of wind turbines. And another thing is environmental factors. As you know, most of our installations are now going offshore. And by going offshore, they are introduced to marine hair, which is quite humid, leads to corrosion and condensation in the cooling medium of the transformer. And another vital reason is grid code compliance. Um, if we're very much aware with um, existing grid codes, one of the stipulation is the fact that your, gener your wind turbine must remain connected to the system, irrespective of the type of um, faults, either voltage sag or asymmetrical voltage unbalance or symmetrical voltage unbalance. And the turbine itself, must ensure that by generating reactive current into the grid, it helps the grid recover from the faults that has been established. Now, when that happens, because of the sudden um, drop in voltage of the grid energy, you have um, magnetic flux um, derivation in the grid side of the transformer. 
And because the magnetic flux derivation decays slowly, it leads to inrush of current in the transformer itself. And by that, you have a lot of electrical stress and it exerts some um, exhale forces on the transformer, also further degrading the um, insulation. Now, what are the types of trans wind turbine transformers we use? We have the one of the most popular is the vacuum cast oil transformer. It's a dry um, type of transformer, non-flammable, but the, the downside is that um, it's very bulky because it's um, based on, the, ins the insulation is based on hair and racing. The no load losses is quite significant. Now, looking at the drawback from the cast oil, we have the liquid immersed transformer, which uses mineral oil as its um, dielectric um, component. But the downside is the flammable nature. It has a high risk factor of, being, of causing um, fire disaster. Then the bioslim transformer was actually created specifically for wind turbines with the motive of creating a compact um, transformer that can actually be put in the nasal or in the tower so as to looking at all the drawbacks from the two previous transformers. But the cost factor is also a major problem with this. And even though the manufacturer claims that it's very compact, the weight of a standard um, two megawatts um, bioslim bio transformer is still about five tons, which is still very, Hi. So if you look at the comparison, we see they both have their, all three have their advantages and their disadvantage. There is no winner here. We can just make like, based on maybe our budget or our, um, the, the location of our application and stuff. So why not eliminate the transformer itself and forget about all the drawbacks? Um, when we eliminate the transformer, one of the advantages is the fact that um, we increase the voltage level of our application and reduce the current level. So we are minimizing the losses in our cable. And another thing is it just simplifies the development of our wind power plants. But on the downside, and um, this um, sketch here is just to illustrate when I say transformerless, there are basically two types of transformer in a wind power plant, the substation and the wind turbine transformer attached to the converter. I'm actually interested in eliminating the one attached to the converter. Now, there are obviously drawbacks in um, eliminating the transformer. Apart from the voltage transformation that goes on by using the transformer, we also need the transformer to minimize the <coughs> injection of DC components into the grid. Um, another part of the grid code is that the amount of DC component that's going to be injected into the grid must be rated at about 0.5% of the output current from the converter. So the transformer itself gives us um, a sort of um, galvanic isolation because of its um, principle of um, induction, which it operates by. And also, the windings, the transformer windings also helps in reducing the impact of voltage sag that we might experience coming from the grid side into the transformer. And another thing is the excessive use of um, complex um, multi-level converter topology in the wind turbine. Now, what are the existing um, configurations we have? We've been able to um, classify the existing topologies basically into two. We have the generator converter configuration and the three-stage power converter configuration. And I'll be explaining what each means in a bit. Now, for the Generator converter configuration is simply based on having um, a modular 
generator and also a multi-level modular converter topology. And um, this operates by This operates by eliminating the ion core in a generator and replacing it by either a lightweight composite structure or just the air core. And by doing that, we, we, we tend to reduce the weight of a generator. But on the downside, we also reduce the hair gap density flux. And in order to, for us to get as much torque as possible that we might require, we need to have a bigger diameter of our generator. And the stator coil requires a special arrangement to isolate it. And the stator coil will serve as an input to our converter topology, a direct input to our converter topology here on the red line. I think my thing is kind of tilting to the, to the side. Is there a way you can rectify that? Okay, don't worry, I'll carry on. I'll just explain. And for the converter stage, and for the converter stage, we have the active, the basic active rectifier where the stator core serves as the input, and the active rectifier acts as an individual DC link balancing tool. And on the inverter side, you have the normal H bridge um, inverter, which could be cascaded hop, which could be cascaded hop to the voltage level you need, and also provides a high degree of um, fault tolerance. So I need to speed up a bit now. And for the other configuration, we have the street stage power converter configuration. This is actually using standard um, topologies: the diode rectifier, a DC-DC boost and a four-level diode clamp um, converter. And there are other variations to this as well. We can, have, we can also have a cascaded um, approach whereby we use the dual active bridge circuit in the DC point to step it up. And we have a cascaded um, converter on the grid side. And again, in another um, research paper, another form of um, the three-stage system whereby you have a switched um, modular-based resonance um, converter on the DC boost stage, and you have a three-level diode clamp. But the downside of using this topology is in order for us to get to a high voltage, we have to connect our uh, semiconductors in series because of the limitations of the voltage. So on each semiconductor here, you have seven IGBT modules connected in series. Now the parameters for all those topologies I've just listed is um, you have your collection point voltage, your grid voltage being 11 kV for the generator converter module another 11 kg for your high frequency link MMC, and your four level diode clamp converter, you have 6.6 kV, and the last one with the three level diode clamp, 20 kV. Now, in estimating, in estimating our conduction and switching losses, we actually extracted our uh, our loss energy parameters from the, from the data sheet and also use the um, curve fitting techniques via MATLAB um, script files to get our, our data. And based on these following um, equations was what we used. Um, this is for the equation for the on state of the IGBT and the equation for the on state of the diode and the turn on energy equation for the IGBT, the turn off for the IGBT, the turn off for the diode, and our average um, power loss of the IGBT module and the average power loss 
for the diode. And the, the fitting parameters for each IGBT and diode model used in the previous shown um, was extracted from the manufacturer's data sheets. And these are the parameters that we obtained. And um, this was the results we got from our conduction and switching loss. For the on-state energy of the IGBT, as expected, the three-level diode clamp had the most um, conduction loss in this regard, and mainly because we are using more components. And we can also see for the four-level, although we are using less components, but because it's a 6.5 kV IGBT, and the on-state um, voltage and on-state resistance is quite high, that's why we have a much higher increase than these two previous ones. The 4.5 kV was used in the high frequency leak MMC, which showed a very, the lowest value. And for the MMC, the generator converter module, it was a 1.7 kV used. And also all the other, um, the on-state energy of the diode were actually similar experience as explained in the on-state energy. Now for our average power loss as expected, the three-level diode topped the list. And the, the results we got here was actually in, um, in synchrony with what we had achieved earlier. Now, to connect, to remove the transformer from the system, the wind turbine transformer, that is, you need to connect to your, directly to your collector points, which varies depending on the country you have and on also your wind turbine configuration, your wind farm configuration. Now, you can either connect to a 6.6 kV, 11 kV, 22 kV, or 33 kV, those are European standards, and if you are in America, I think it starts from like 6.9 all the way to 34.5. Now, a medium DC link voltage required for this was obtained, calculated to be 11 kV, 17 kV, and 34 kV, and 51 kV. Now, in order to have a multi-level um, converter, you need to have a five level, a seven level, a nine level and an 11 level if you were using a 4.5 kV IGBT module. Now based on our results, one of the things we obtained and also on our study was that the MMC modular multi-level converter showed better efficiency than, the, than other grid side converter topologies due to the low voltage rated values of the IGBTs and diode models. But a downside to this is the fact that the complications required in boosting to this level is very high. And if we're using a diode clamp as well, the 4.5 kV rated is actually ideal. And also the generator converter configuration it's not so straightforward because we need special stator winding arrangements. And the three-stage power converter configuration is more visible approach for developing transformerless configurations for wind energy applications. And um, I'll just end it there. Thank you very much. Okay, Nola, thank you very much for that. Um, we have time for one question. One question. We have one over there, two over there, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my brother, that's a wonderful presentation out there. Oh, no, not. <laughs> okay. I have only one question basically in relation to the transformerless uh, power generation of the wind turbine. My question goes in this manner. Now, we, since we know the basic function of the, the transformer, I suppose you do know that, but just, just, just like a layman, I'll let everyone know what is the duty of the transformer. The transformer actually converts the, the power supply into a upgraded standard that you need as per 
requirement of either a facility or a household uh, village or a business area. So that means if we have a power supply that can supply 240 uh, volts, yet your business requires about 500 volts, you need a transformer to do that job for you and give you a relevant grade of electricity, right? Now, now that we have the basic idea of what the transformer is, the question is, on the, y, on the transformerless uh, form of generation now, you said you were going to have the converters and the diodes and all these kind of integrities, which require a multi-component system. Get that? Now, how do you think the, the generated uh, power will be changeable or modulated in order to fit for each uh, area that the power is meant to be supplied to? That is stepping up power or stepping down power, which is the only duty that the transformer is required for. So if there's no transformer, how do you hope to achieve that activity? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you for doing some further explanation. Um, <laughs> what, um, if, you, if you were following me very well, one of the things I said earlier was um, the wind um, farm has two types of transformers. It has a substation transformer and a wind turbine transformer, okay? Now, the substation transformer is the one that actually is much more closer to the grid, okay? We have the wind turbine transformer that steps up from the voltage from the converter attached to the wind generator to the collection point, then further step up from the collection point to the transmission or distribution, okay? So probably your question is much more related to the substation transformer. The substation transformer is still going to be there. It's the wind turbine transformer that we're getting rid of, okay? And in terms of how we're going to increase the voltage, we have, so between the generator side transformer, there is a DC boost transformer, a DC boost converter, rather, okay? That boosts the voltage range to the grid side and the grid side to the collection point. So the, 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 the grid side converter is actually designed for the voltage range of the collection point. Did I? That was good, thank you, Akinola. All right. um, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have to finish. Uh, we, we're eating into the time of the next session. Uh, please join me in thanking all our speakers. You did a marvelous job. <laughs>